Hello everyone and welcome to the 1 million subscribers milestone video featuring none other than the magician from Riga. Now uh, those of you who are new to the channel may not know this but uh, the, the great magician is uh, uh, well sort of a sort of a sole protector of this channel. Uh, he watches over us every day uh, while we're analyzing chess games. You can see him up there right uh, above me above above the fat chocobo and uh, uh, whenever this channel hits a milestone we show a nice game played by the by the magician. Here uh, he faces a most a vile opponent. It's a uh, Russian Grandmaster Lev Polgaevsky and uh, so far they've played four games and all, uh, all four games uh, ended in a draw but this one this one's a bit different and Polgaevsky is one of those opponents that uh, Misha couldn't really uh, play against as he couldn't be tricked. Uh, Misha often uh, liked to hypnotize people, you know, just uh, uh, get them into time trouble, complicate, complicate, complicate and then they would blunder but not uh, grandmasters such as Pologevsky here or maybe Paul Karras or, or some uh, other very very strong grandmasters. Now it's a very very exciting game uh, from 1959 uh, a year you all know very well due to the 1959 candidates tournament but this is from the 1959 uh, USSR championship uh, that featured uh, an, a 19 of the of the the absolute strongest uh, uh, players uh, imaginable but we're gonna we're gonna discuss that a little bit later so now uh, we are going to check out the game, but for uh, for those of you who are interested, I will show you the play button uh, because it's uh, quite large. I did not expect it to be so large. So here are, are the contents of the uh, of the YouTube present that I received yesterday. Uh, so here it is. This is a, a letter uh, from the uh, from the YouTube CEO Susan. Uh, you can't read it. Maybe you can. Maybe you can't. I don't know. But basically, it says, you know, uh, congratulations on building such a nice community, on uh, achieving the, this milestone for for being the greatest chess channel and, and so on. You know, the pretty usual stuff. Uh, and here, just to show you the difference between the the gold and the silver play button. Uh, here's the silver play button. So this is the gentleman you all know. Uh, we, you've seen this, uh, received uh, when the channel reached 100,000 subscribers, so there you have it. It's, uh, you know, of reasonable size, you know, maybe a bit larger than my head, if you can, if you can see. Uh, but now check out the, the golden play button, it's really, really a monster, and it's very heavy too. So let me just, uh, okay, that's a, that's a really heavy dude, sorry about that. Alright, there we go. All right, look at this bad boy. All right, this is the golden play button. There we go. It's quite larger than my head. There. Oh, the, now you can even see my microphone. There you have it. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is the golden play button, which you receive when your channel on YouTube reaches 1 million subscribers. I can't really get it uh, away from the glare, but ah, there you have it. There you have it. Presented to Agad Matar for passing 1 million subscribers. So it's quite a large one. I never knew that uh, the golden play button is so large. I always thought all of them were uh, of the same size, just different material. Uh, but it is it is quite a nice one, and I will uh, very very gladly uh, place it on, uh, on my wall in my uh, in my new recording studio that will almost uh, that is almost fully operational. Uh, that being said, uh, I know uh, uh, when I got the, uh, the the previous one, I said I'm not going to do any sort of unpacking, but I just wanted to show you this one as it's so large. Uh, so that being said, let's check out this very nice game as this is what we're here to do. So uh, Misha versus uh, Love Pologaevsky, uh, like I said, this is their fifth game and uh, uh, <laughs> Tal opens with e4 as he usually does. Uh, we have c5 by Pologaevsky going for the Sicilian defense, knight to f3, d6 and uh, strikes uh, in the center. Uh, as this is what you want to do, we have captures on d4, knight captures and knight to f6, so attacking the e4 pawn, uh, Tal defends it and now a6, going for the knight of, uh, uh, knight of defense, we have bishop to g5 and now knight b to d7, the knight is coming to c5 at some point, we have bishop to c4 by Misha and now queen to a5, uh, queen to b6 is also very popular nowadays as this variation is still being played, uh, but queen to a5 was, was the go-to move in those days, putting pressure on the bishop here on g5, and here just queen to d2, defending the bishop on g5. Uh, and here Pologevsky played e6, and it does make sense, uh, you kind of want to weaken white slight square bishop here, and also you want to uh, continue developing, you have to play e6, bishop e7, castles, and so on. Uh, but here, uh, again, nowadays uh, h6 would be would be the good move, as uh, su such a move has been seen, for example, in the game Alireza Firuja versus Anton Korobov in the 2019 World Rapid Championship that, that Alireza won. 
but like I said, instead here we have e6 and now uh, tall castles. We have castles, bishop to e7, Pologevsky also prepares the castle, and now rook a to d1. Still to this day, the, the absolute top move, rook a to d1, and now comes knight to c5. And this is a... Uh, this is already uh, 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 the, the beginning of the end, I would say, not, not really the end, but uh, here uh, the position is still being played today, and h6 is the move that uh, black wants to play here. After h6, then everything just falls into order. Uh, black, uh, white will either uh, get get rid of the bishop with, for example, bishop to f4, and then you shift the knight over to e5, attack the light square bishop, and so on. Uh, but here we have knight to c5 right away, and it seems like it's a good move. It puts pressure on the e4 pawn, and white needs to react to this. Uh, Tal defends with rook f to e1, and now we have bishop to d7. Uh, so what do you play here? Here, <laughs> the position is, uh, uh, positionally, the position is lost for black, uh, but it's not that easy to spot. I will just... Uh, uh, ask you to pause the video here and try to find the idea here. It's a pretty standard idea uh, when you play against the Sicilian, so uh, feel free to pause the video here and try to find the best move for white uh, while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on uh, spotting the, the beauty. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, e5 is possible here, but it's actually knight to f5. Knight to f5, and now you have a triple attack on the d6 pawn, and the black needs to react to this. Uh, not capturing the knight doesn't really do anything, but um, uh, you, you have to capture uh, Otherwise, you're just uh, going to start losing material. So here you would have captures, captures. And now the black king is stuck in the center of the board. You can't really go anywhere, otherwise the bishop will be captured. So here you would have to go for something like knight here, uh, try and force a queen trade and give back some material. For example, knight captures on e4, queen captures on d2, knight captures on f6 with check, g captures as the bishop is pinned, and now bishop captures back on d2. Bishop captures on f5, and now bishop to d5 uh, going after this pawn. Also, bishop to f4 will be an idea going after d6. The black king is still in the center of the board. So it's a bishop pair versus bishop pair. But look at white spawn structure and look at black spawn structure. White spawn structure is completely intact, whereas black spawn structure, that's four pawn islands, uh, that's uh, that's pretty bad. And with, with perfect play, this is most likely winning for white. Uh, but Tal had a different idea. Tal did not go for this uh, bishop to, uh, for this knight to f5 move. Tal instead played a3 here. So congratulations to those who found this not an engine favorite but uh if you found the move that the magician found then uh, congratulations that's even better than finding the engine's move so here the threat is b4 just winning the piece as it would come with a double attack on the queen and on the knight so queen back to c7 by Pologevsky and now b4 pushing the knight back we have knight to a4 and now comes uh, the, the beauty. Knight captures on a4. And now, of course, you cannot capture on c4 because knight to b6 just wins the rook on a8. So you have to capture back. We have bishop captures on a4. And now we reach the position from the thumbnail. So feel free to pause the video here and try to find the move that uh, uh, Tal played uh, while I give you a couple of seconds uh, one more time. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on sacrificing something on e6 because that's what you have to do. It doesn't really matter what you sacrifice, you have to sacrifice something. And here, uh, Tal played bishop captures on e6. Uh, and it's interesting, knight captures on e6 also works, but it's uh, it's like Tal knew that it simply wasn't enough to go for a win. But it is super exciting. Uh, okay, now you have a question. Do you capture the bishop or the knight? If you capture the bishop, then it's game over. Then just uh, uh, knight captures on g7 with check, king to f8, and now knight back to f5. And although it looks like it's playable, it's really not. Here, for example, queen captures on c2, uh, going after this... Um, uh, going after this queen here, uh, you just play bishop captures on f6. So what do you play now? Doesn't really matter. For example, queen captures on d2, you're going to capture on e7 with check. Uh, or rather, you don't have to, but if you play something like bishop captures on f6, then you also allow queen captures here, and then it's even worse. So here, uh, after bishop captures, we have queen captures, bishop captures on e7 with check, 
king to e8 and now you're just gonna win back the queen and then you're up a piece so this is obviously not playable so after knight captures an e6 uh you you cannot go after the bishop you have to go after the knight so we would see probably captures and captures and now you get this position where the black king is stuck in the middle the bishop prevents castling king side or queen side and it's a it's a trade-off a piece for for two pawns that doesn't really even uh, I mean, shouldn't even classify as a as, as a sacrifice, at least not by tall standards. So here, instead, after bishop captures on a4, uh, Misha did not go for knight captures, rather he went for bishop captures on e6. And this is a little bit different, uh, but the bishop has to be accepted, otherwise you're just down a pawn, and there's really no point in doing anything uh, other than that. Uh, for example, you could castle, then white just brings back the bishop, and it's a... It's a uh, a terrible position for black because black was hoping at some point with the help of the e6 pawn to maybe execute d5 here without the e6 pawn uh, executing d5 is never happening and at some point white will simply have too much pressure on the d file and that pawn will be captured so instead after bishop captures on e6 we have f captures on e6 accepting uh tall sacrifice and now comes knight captures on e6 attacking the queen the g7 pawn and black needs to find a move and there is only one good move for polugevsky here and he finds it and that's queen captures on c2 you have to move the queen so why not move the queen with tempo the tempo of course being you want to trade off the queens and enjoy your extra piece and now uh misha goes for queen to d4 interestingly knight captures on g7 with check is also possible but extremely tricky i will show it however uh, that's why we're here it's uh, it's quite the, the game uh, for example king to f7 attacking the knight queen to d4 sacrificing yet another piece king captures on g7 and now rook to c1 and now uh, you will see what happens here uh, black is up two pieces but it doesn't matter queen to b3 now e5 so what do you play here d captures on e5 rook captures on e5 threatening the bishop also the rook is coming to c7 so here uh, black is completely lost and unless black finds queen to f7 queen to f7 only move that saves pologevsky and now uh, tal would be able to go into this crazy bishop to h6 check king captures on h6 and now queen to e3 with check and also a double attack on the bishop doesn't really matter uh well it does matter if you go king g6 then you're even getting checkmated with queen to g5 so you have to go up the board uh king to g7 then rook captures and then you will win the queen but uh, black is up too much material or maybe maybe not too, too much just enough for example rook 8 to d8 and now you can trade queens here captures captures but it doesn't matter uh, black is very happy if rook to c7 check you can simply block rook to d7 and black uh, for example if if captures and captures or even better with the knight, with the bishop you have two pieces and a rook for the queen and this is more than enough to uh to, uh, to fight white uh, white to a draw at least so instead after queen to c2 we don't have knight captures on g7 but tal first prepares it with queen to d4 so here we have king to f7 again tal uh, is able to go for this knight captures on g7 line and transpose into the line that we've just discussed but he goes rook to c1 he wants to shift his rook over uh, to, to the seventh rank queen to a2 now attacking the knight here and now e5 offering this knight for uh, for uh, for a counterplay along the e file polgevsky first captures uh, on e5 as um uh, anything else would be would be extremely dangerous so d captures on e5 queen captures on e5 and now we get this position where uh, uh i mentioned at the beginning of the video usually uh tal defeated his opponents by uh, overworking them by making them calculate by making them go into time trouble then they would blunder they would uh uh, you know, uh, start uh, start getting nervous. It, it, you know, the position would get more complicated and complicated. But this usually didn't work against players like uh, like Polugevsky here. But here, uh, it's almost as if it did work because here, uh, what you have to do is go for this very very unpleasant queen to d5 move, just uh, offering the piece back. And there's there's no better move here for Black now uh, because then we go into bishop captures on f6. Now adding a defender to the queen captures captures uh sorry captures on e5 and now king captures on e6 going in front of um, uh, the rook but there aren't all that uh, great discoveries here bishop captures on g7 yes this is possible but you're still gonna move and you're gonna give up the rook as well so bishop captures rook captures and we would get this position where tal would have two rooks but polgevsky would have a rook and the bishop pair which is more than 
more than uh, sufficient to fight the rooks. The bishop can come to c6, this guy maybe to d6, and yeah, you would be able to, to play this no problem. So this is what uh, Pologaevsky had to do in order to su survive this onslaught, but he decided to trade down into a different endgame and played queen captures on f2. Yep, that's the one that he played, queen captures on f2 with check, and now you have to capture, or maybe even you don't, but after, let's say, king to h1, then bishop on c6, and suddenly it's white who's on the it's it's black who's on the attack. So instead, after this queen captures on f2, uh, Tal decided to capture the queen, we have king captures, and now of course comes the royal fork, knight to g4, checking the king, and uh, also forking the queen, we have king to g1, and knight captures on e5. So similar to that, we have rook captures on e5, and now bishop captures on g5. Uh, you have to capture with the knight, if the rook captures, then the knight falls, so knight captures on g5 with check, and now king to g6, you have to go uh, to this very very unpleasant uh, square, uh, because uh, anything else simply will not do, it It will be too dangerous to allow any checks with, with this rook along the 7th rank, it's just going to be... Uh, crushing. So here, king to g6, still good because the the king uh, still has the the uh, defense of the g7 pawn here. And now, well, Tal could go rook to c7, and there's nothing wrong with that. He first prepares it with knight to e6. Now, rook to c7 could be very deadly, as it would come with a double attack. We have rook h to e8 by Polgievsky, and now Misha goes rook to e3. This is uh, sort of an attacking defensive move, because he doesn't want to allow this to come with a double attack. So instead, he goes back rook to e3, and now rook a to c8. So it seems Polgievsky developed all of, it, all of his pieces, uh, the, bishop on a, the bishop on a4 still needs to find a good square, uh, probably something like b5 or c6 in the future will be uh, will be what, uh, what should be played. And here uh, we have rook to f1 by Misha. Uh, interestingly, going for rook to g3 check right away is possible, but you don't achieve anything. King f7, you're gonna uh, capture on c8, rook captures, rook captures, and now you're gonna capture on g7. Yes, you win a pawn, but black wins it back very easily. Rook to c1 with check, king to f2, rook c2 check, you're gonna go king to e1, and now bishop to c6. And this is how black wins back the pawn. Uh, or uh, if white uh, is persistent in defending and then just uh, bishop to b5 check. And we would probably see a repetition of moves here. King e1, bishop uh, attacks the pawn, uh, king goes back, bishop here, and, and so on and so on. So here after rook 8 to c8, we do not have uh, such a, such an idea starting with rook to g3, but Tal instead goes for... Um, uh, instead goes for this uh, bishop to b5, sorry, Polgavsky goes for bishop to b5. Tal instead of rook to g3 went for rook to f1. Uh, and now it's uh, it's getting very dangerous. Now the king is completely cut off from the f-file and rook to g3 could be, could be very problematic. So here we have bishop to b5. And here uh, bishop to d7 is the move that's missing in all of the lines that Pologevsky tries to defend this position. Bishop to d7 is crucial uh, because, uh, well, you, you just need it. For example, rook g3 check, king to h6, knight captures on g7, and now you just play rook to f8. And everything is uh, perfect now because the bishop here uh, completely controls all of the squares that the knight can use to, to go back into the game. So here the knight is pretty much stranded on g7 and it's hard to say if white would be able to do anything here. Uh, Polgevsky, however, doesn't go for bishop to... Uh, d7, he goes bishop to b5, attacks Tal's rook on f1, and now rook to g3 with check. We have king to h6, and now again, what do you play here? Here, Tal went for knight captures on g7. Uh, I know you're probably, probably thinking, why not rook f4 with rook to h4 checkmate? Well, the problem is rook to c1 with check, king f2, and now rook to f1 with check, and all of white's pieces uh, just get uh, destroyed. King e3, you're gonna get rook captures here with check, and that's just if rook here, even rook e1 check, uh, there is nothing to do. You have to move the king and then just uh, rook captures rook. It's a uh, complete uh, uh, annihilation. So here after king to h6, we have knight captures on g7 instead by Misha. And now rook to f8. 
so trying to cut that uh, knight off uh, from uh, escaping and also offering a trade of rooks along the f file uh, you could go for the rook with the bishop captures on f1 it is possible but uh, the knight captures rook here so it doesn't really matter and then if after rook captures king captures here Tal would go into this rook and pawn endgame being up a pawn, uh, which probably isn't losing for Pologevsky, but Pologevsky decides that he can do better. So he goes rook to f8 instead, and now comes rook to e1. Again, what do you play here? We have rook to f6, very important. You do not want to allow rook to e6. And here, uh, Tal goes for h3. Very important if you want to do any sort of a rook lift uh, to avoid that trick that we've just seen, rook to c1 followed by rook to f1 check. So here, uh, Pologevsky, uh, for, for the last time, uh, needs to play bishop to d7. After bishop to d7, everything uh, works out for him. Because even now, rook to e5, threatening checkmate with rook to h5, uh, does not win uh, because of uh, rook to g6. And now everything is perfectly fine. You are attacking the rook, attacking the knight, and there is no knight f5 check because bishop captures on f5. That's the beauty of bishop to d7. However... Uh, after h3, we have rook to c2 by Pologevsky, and now the position is completely lost for him. Probably played due to time trouble, uh, but uh, it, it, it doesn't seem like, uh, uh, like, uh, like a reasonable move to do, especially since he was defending. But uh, I don't think he was aware of all the mating threats, uh, because if he, if he had, he'd probably find bishop to d7. So this is pretty crazy stuff. Uh, so here, Tal, of course, immediately went rook to e4. Uh, for, the, for the fun of it, I will show how rook to e5 is also playable. Uh, now, rook to g6, the move that we said that works in the variation where the bishop is on d7 doesn't work because now Misha has knight to f5 check, king to h5, and now just knight to e3 check, uh, a discovery winning the rook here. Uh, so that's why that's why it doesn't work. Uh, it's completely hopeless now. For example, a king here, you can trade with check and then just pick up the rook and your position is completely winning. So instead, after rook to c2, we have rook to e4. Uh, now going for this other checkmate seems pretty pretty uh, straightforward. But now Pologevsky can defend with rook to c4. And he does. He now defends against checkmate. And only now Tal shifts the rook over to e5. Now threatening rook to h5 checkmate. And here Pologevsky probably realized that he completely messed up. I don't know the the whole story of this game. Probably Pologevsky uh, started spending his time too much and then he missed this uh, uh, a lot of these ideas from uh, from Tal. But, you know, you, you can't uh, avoid losing all of them. Like I said, this is their fifth game uh, ever uh, and uh, the first four ended in a draw. So here Pologevsky played rook to c1 with check. Uh, Tal played king, sorry, uh, Tal played king to h2, and it was in this position. On move 34, yes, we are only at move 34, but we've uh, covered a lot of lines because it's it's quite the game. Uh, Love Pologevsky resigned the game as there is nothing more to be done here. Uh, once you try this, uh, the only defense basically that we have, uh, you cannot prevent uh, rook to h5. Uh, both of these squares, bishop to e2 that covered that square and bishop to e8 that covered that square, are covered by the rook. So the rook prevents the bishop from helping out with the defense. So here, uh, if rook to g6, like we said, we just go into the, the this knight to f5 check, king to h5, and now, okay, you don't have... Uh, knight to e3 check winning the rook because the rook is now on c1 but it doesn't matter and this is what uh, Pologevsky probably missed uh, when he went into all of this uh, knight to e7 check now wins this rook and not only do you win the rook but after king h6 and knight captures on g6 h captures you get this rook to e6 move and now it's not going to be you're not going to be just down one pawn and the exchange you're going to be down two pawns in the exchange and that's just uh, not playable at all uh, because uh, but the, the rook, um, the rooks are defending all of these squares that the bishop can defend, so you will not be able to to defend the pawn anyway. Next move, uh, Tal will just capture the pawn. Everything, uh, all of his pawns are nicely defended, and that's just it. So uh, the first decisive game uh, between Tal and Polgaevsky goes to goes to uh, the magician, and uh, wh what a game it was. Uh, but I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning of the video, uh, but in classical games, uh, La Polgaevsky has a pretty brutal positive score against uh, Mikhail Tal. He defeated him eight to two with twenty two draws. So uh, out of all of those 32 games they played, uh, Tal only won two, two games, this being this being one of them. So as you can see, Tal, uh, if he couldn't work his magic against you, you, you definitely had a chance of, of playing against him. 
Uh, so, uh, quite the tournament, and uh, interestingly, Tal did not win it. The tournament was won by Tigran Petrosian, one full point ahead of uh, Mikhail Tal and Boris Paski. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's not uh, not an easy task winning the, the USSR championship. But, uh, you know, scoring second place uh, tied with, with uh, uh, Boris Paski, uh, definitely, definitely a, a victory in itself. Uh, and also, there is one one um, a photo I wanted to show you. It's uh, actually from this tournament. It's from the, uh, from the uh, analysis of the final game between uh, uh, between Mikhail Tal and Mark Taimanov. Uh, they're analyzing their game. It, it ended in a draw, uh, but you can see how 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 good a photo it is. We don't have many photos of this championship. I'm sure there uh, some somewhere there are these photos that they exist somewhere on the internet, uh, but. Um, uh, very hard to find. I, I think I, I found this one on uh, Olympia Urkan's uh, Twitter Twitter feed. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so we can enjoy at least uh, some of the imagery uh, that uh, of what happened there. Uh, so yeah, that's the game. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Really a wild one. And uh, yeah, there there are still are a lot of tournaments that we have to cover. This being one of them. As you can, if you you know. Uh, so so many great games played here. Uh, we will we will cover all of them at some point, but you know, uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes. Uh, so yeah, once again, if you guys are interested, this is the the big big fellow, uh, the YouTube golden YouTube play button. There we have it. Really a monstrosity. Doesn't doesn't even fit in the screen. There we have it. Uh, and yeah. Uh, <laughs> I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the game. Uh, I I, the, the, I searched uh, for quite a while to decide which game to show, and there are so many of them. Uh, but it's um, it's it's a very special feeling when uh, when Misha defeats a player uh, such as uh, Polgevsky because he he's just super strong and he doesn't uh, you know he doesn't um, just cover up when you attack him. He fights back. He's also a great uh, attacking player himself. And uh, I thought that this one this one was uh, more more than fitting. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. I hope you guys enjoyed it one more time. Uh, I would like to thank Frank Combs, uh, John Nicely, Sadek Ryan Aktush, uh, Yura Antal, and Robert Smithers for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon. Uh, continuing the coverage of the Morphe Saga, checking up on your wonderful suggestions, and uh, whatever else happens uh, in the chess world. So thank you all, I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day, and thank you once again for helping this channel uh, reach this magical number of 1 million subscribers. Uh, see you soon.